Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today we're going to be continuing our exploration of real analysis and talk in detail about the gamma function and also a very closely related function called the digamma function, which is defined as the logarithmic derivative of gamma. So firstly, what is the gamma function in case you are not already familiar with its definition? So the gamma function is defined as an improper integral from zero to infinity of t to the x minus one e to the minus t, and the integral is with respect to t, obviously giving a function of x. And the gamma function can be defined only on the interval zero to infinity, but you can technically define it on all of R as long as you exclude the negative and also zero integers. But we'll omit that for the entirety of this conversation since it doesn't really serve much of a purpose, at least for today. So obviously if we're claiming that the domain of this gamma function is zero to infinity open on zero, that means that this function is well-defined. So that's gonna be the very first theorem that I want to explore today. And that is the function gamma, gamma is well-defined, is well-defined on zero to infinity. That is, we need to show that this integral even converges um, for all x in that interval. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this proof up into two parts. I'm going to partition the interval zero to infinity, and I'm going to write this interval as zero to one union one to infinity. And whether you include one in the left or right of that interval is really up to you, but when it comes to integrals, you should already know it doesn't matter. So let's see what we have here. So let's show that this integral converges on zero, one. So the integral from zero to one of e to the minus t times t to the x minus one dt. So I'm going to be focusing on this little e to the minus t first just a little bit, because if you know that that's just gonna be an exponential k function on all of t, but moreover from zero to one, it looks like this function here and whether those are closed or open dots really doesn't matter in this conversation. So when t is equal to zero, notice that we have one and when t is equal to one, we have one over e. Therefore, this not this object is always in between zero to one. So it's going to be making that t to the x minus one smaller than it was, right? Because it's just a percentage of what it was. This is a non-negative function. So it's going to be decreasing. And obviously, e to the minus t to the x minus one is a positive function. Um, so if you make the function smaller, the integral will also be smaller as well. So that means this integral, if it converges, is going to be less than the integral from zero to one of t to the x minus one dt. Notice that the variable here is going to be t so that I can use the power rule on this. So I'm gonna add one to that exponent and then divide by that new exponent. And then I'm going to evaluate this as t goes to one and as t goes to zero. So as t goes to one, we're gonna have one to the power of x over x, which is just gonna be equal to one. And when t goes to zero, that's just gonna give us zero, which is going to be equal to uh, one over x. So what is x? Well, x is going to belong to open interval zero to one, so we don't have any issues in terms of the, de the definition of one over x. Um, therefore, the integral from zero to one of our gamma function integrand is well-defined since it converges. So now let's assume or take a look at the rest of the integral. In particular, we're going to be looking at the integral from one to infinity of t to the x minus one e to the minus t dt. And we're going to be looking at this integral for a moment. Now, what I want to do is I want to sort of think about what's going on between this function here and this function here, because keep in mind, we're changing t and t is going to get eventually super, super large. So eventually, as we already know from La Hopital's rule, the dominated convergence theorem, whichever one follows for you, exponential functions are eventually going to dominate our polynomial functions. True. So if that is the case, I'm going to let n, so let n be the real number, the positive real number, such that if t is bigger than or equal to n, this t to the x minus one is going to be smaller than some other function, and particularly e to the t divided by two. Now, I'll explain in a moment why I want t divided by two, but it's not necessarily t over two. You can actually choose some other exponents, um, but keep in mind, I want this to be true for any x in one to infinity. I want that to be true for any 
x in 1 to infinity. So eventually, my exponential increasing function will dominate that polynomial increasing function as t goes to uh, infinity. Um, so I can always establish the existence of such an m. So when I use, look at this integral, I'm going to decompose this, obviously, um, from the integral from 1 to m plus the integral from n to infinity of our integrand, t to the x minus 1, e to the minus t dt. So that's going to be less than, so we're going to have the integral from 1 to n. I don't need to touch this first integral because we're going to be on a closed and bounded domain, and the integrand is continuous on 1 to a positive number. So this integral, t to the x minus 1, e to the minus t dt, this is definitely going to be equal to a finite number because we already know that Riemann integrable functions, you know, the product of integrable functions is also integrable, and the integral of a Riemann integrable function on a closed amount of interval will also be Riemann integrable because it's continuous, right? So that's going to be a real number, so that's not the issue here, but we're going to be looking at the next interval, which is n to infinity. Now, once we start at n and get even bigger, notice that t to the x minus 1 is now going to be dominated by e to the power of t over 2. So I'm going to have e to the power of t over 2 times e to the minus t dt, right? So as long as this integral converges, then we have that this integral is going to converge as well. So that's going to be equal to, again, the integral from 1 to m of t to the x minus 1 e to the minus t dt, whatever that is. And then we're going to have the integral from n to infinity. And then we're going to have what? So we're going to have 1 half minus 1, which is going to be equal to minus 1 half of t dt. So what is this integral right here equal to? So that integral is going to be equal to minus 1 half e to the minus 1 half t, and that needs to be reciprocated, so that should be minus 2, right? And then we're going to be sending t to infinity and t going to capital M, where n is a positive real number. So as n goes to infinity, where we know that that's going to go to zero, so we're going to have that's going to go to zero, and then minus e to the minus one half capital M, and that's obviously going to be equal to positive two e to the power of one half n, which is obviously a real number since n is a real number. So we have that our original integral is less than this sum of a real and that sum of a real, and therefore we're going to have that the integral from 1 to infinity of t to the x minus 1 e to the minus t dt is going to be a real number as well by the comparison test. So since 0 to 1 and 1 to infinity both converge, therefore we have that the integral from 0 to 1 plus the integral from 1 to infinity of t to the x minus 1 e to the minus t dt, which keep in mind is just the gamma function, is defined on r for all x in the interval 0 to infinity. Right, and another couple things that you definitely should note here that are very important and are actually quite easy to prove is that the gamma function is never negative and never equal to 0, and that's true for all x also in the interval 0 to infinity. Now that we've established the well-definitiveness of the gamma function, let's talk about a few important properties that you definitely should know when it comes to the gamma function. So the very first theorem or, pro or very first property associated with the gamma function that you definitely should know is that gamma of x plus 1 is equal to x times gamma x where x belongs to 0 to infinity. Right. Now the proof of this is actually straightforward and is very friendly even to introductory calculus students. So again, gamma of x plus 1 will be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the x plus 1 minus 1, which is just going to be equal to x, and then e to the minus t dt. Then we can use integration by parts in order to evaluate this. So I'm going to be letting my u be equal to that and my dv be equal to this term. So if I let u be equal to t to the x and keep in mind our variable is t, then the derivative of u with respect to t is going to be equal to x times t to the x minus 1 dt. And then if I let the rest be my dv, e to the minus t dt, then v is going to be equal to minus e to the minus t. 
So once I evaluate that, that's going to give us uv, so minus t to the x, e to the minus t, and that's going to evaluate as t goes to infinity, as t goes to zero, minus the integral from zero to infinity of v, so that's going to change to a total plus, du, so an x is a constant, so we're going to have t to the x minus one, e to the minus t, dt. All right, so when t goes to infinity, this exponential term is going to go to zero. When t goes to zero, why is that infinity? That should be zero. As t goes to zero, this term is going to go to zero as well. So we're going to have zero minus zero, which is actually pretty lame, but nonetheless quite useful. So then we have this number, and keep in mind why x is a constant. This is an integral with respect to time, not x, or not necessarily time, but t. Um, so that's just going to give us x times the integral from zero to infinity of t to the x minus 1, e to the minus t dt, and this by definition is the gamma function, so that means that's just going to be equal to x times gamma x, which completes the proof of that. The next theorem um, is actually quite useful as well, so theorem, let's call it theorem 3, is that gamma is differentiable on 0 to infinity, and I'm going to do the maybe the harder part of the proof um, for this, and I'll leave the rest for you because it's practically just a calculus exercise. So how to prove that gamma is differentiable? Well, we're gonna try and find the derivative of it and make sure it's well-defined everywhere. So the derivative of the gamma function will be equal to the derivative from zero to infinity of t to the x minus one e to the minus t dt. So you should be able to verify that this integrand t to the x minus 1 e to the minus t dt is going to be uh, continuous, in particular uniformly continuous in t, and also differentiable in x. So I can use Leibniz's integral rule and write this as the integral from 0 to infinity times the partial derivative with respect to x of t to the x minus 1 e to the minus t dt. So keep in mind, my variable for this derivative is x. So I actually only really care about this term because e to the minus t is just a constant. So that's an exponential function. So the derivative of an exponential is an exponential times some scalar. So I'm going to have that the derivative of gamma, or I'm just gonna write it as gamma prime, will be equal to the integral from zero to infinity of t to the x minus one times the natural log of that base, which is t, times e to the minus t dt. So that is the gamma function's derivative, and the only thing you have to establish is that this is defined for all x in 0 to 1, and you can use practically similar tricks as established before to establish the well-definitiveness of this function. Right, so that's actually just the introduction to the proof of that, as long as you can establish convergence of this integral, um, then all is well. Because keep in mind, when t goes to zero, natural log of t goes to minus infinity, but t to the x minus one goes to zero. So you have that zero times infinity battle that needs to sort of go on there. Um, so practically you have to use some dominated convergence theorem to establish the convergence of this integral. Right? Um, but nonetheless, not too difficult. So the next function that's closely related to this conversation is the digamma function. So the digamma function, the digamma function, which I'm going to denote as psi, and this is going to map to 0 to infinity to r, is defined by, it's defined by the derivative of the logarithm of gamma. So some people will call it the logarithmic derivative of gamma, right? Now, is this well-defined? So cur currently we have the gamma function, um, which is non-negative. So the natural log of a non-negative and zero value is well-defined. So that's not an issue. Now let's use the chain rule on this object to sort of see what this is equal to. So the derivative of the outside is going to be one over gamma, and then times the derivative of the inside, which is going to be gamma prime. So we're just going to have gamma prime of x over gamma of x. So what do we have? So we have the psi function or digamma function is equal to the derivative of gamma, which is well defined on 0 to infinity, and gamma x also well defined on 0 to infinity, and also gamma function is never equal to 0 on 0 to infinity. So this derivative or function is well defined. 
Now, a very useful property uh, for the di gamma function is the following, um, but we need to use a property of the gamma function in order to define it. So firstly, remember, gamma x plus one was equal to x times gamma of x, and gamma is differentiable on zero to infinity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to differentiate both sides of this expression. I'm gonna write it as the root of gamma x plus one is equal to the derivative of x times gamma of x. So on the right hand side I obviously have to use a product rule and that's going to give us the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide everything by gamma of x plus 1. Gamma of x plus 1 gamma of x plus 1. So I have gamma prime over gamma on the left hand side, so that's obviously going to give us psi of x plus 1. And over here, keep in mind, gamma x plus 1 is just x gamma x. So these x's are going to cancel each other out. I'm going to have gamma prime over gamma, which we know is just going to be equal to psi of x. And then over here, again, this is equal to x gamma x, so our gammas are going to cancel out this time, leaving us with 1 over x on the outside. So the gamma function uh, can be defined in terms of this recursive relation, uh, which is actually pretty interesting. But this recursive relation actually gives rise to a connection to a very important class of numbers. So let's see if we can build that relation. So let's actually um, evaluate this digamma function at a few natural numbers. In particular, let's look at digamma of 2. So digamma of 2 will be equal to digamma of 1 plus 1 over 1, which is 1. Digamma of 3 will be equal to digamma of 2 plus 1 half, but we've already defined what digamma of 2 would be. That's just digamma of 1 plus 1. So that's going to be digamma of 1 plus 1 plus 1 half. And if I continue in this fashion, digamma of 4 will be equal to digamma of 3 plus 1 third, which will be equal to digamma of 1 plus 1 plus 1 half plus one third. But notice that the right hand side is just the third harmonic number. So I can write this instead as digamma of one plus the third harmonic number H3. So we have psi four is equal to psi one plus H3. Similarly, you can show that psi five is equal to psi one plus H4. And using mathematical induction, you can establish the identity that psi of m plus 1 is equal to psi of 1 plus hm. So this is a very beautiful connection between the digamma and the harmonic number. And keep in mind, the psi 1 is actually just a constant. But is there anything special about this constant? Well, we'll return to that question in just a moment. Before we get into the proof of the next result, I just want to recall a very important constant known as the euler mascheroni constant that we defined and explored a little bit ago. In particular, if we take the harmonic number, which diverges as n goes to infinity, and take the natural log of n, which also diverges as n goes to infinity, if we subtract these divergent sequences, you actually get a convergent sequence hm minus ln n, and it converges to this number gamma, which is approximately like 0.5-ish. Right, and it's called the euler mascheroni constant. Now, is it possible that we can express the euler mascheroni constant as an integral, right? So I just want to do a couple little integral exercise before we get into the next proof, which can be a little intimidating um, to those beginners. So recall that the nth harmonic number can be represented as the integral from zero to one of one minus x to the power of n all over one minus x dx, right? And you can easily see that because that turns into uh, x minus x to the m minus one with a bunch of sums. And then when we integrate it, that goes up to n and we need to divide the, that by n that gives us the nth harmonic number. And the natural log of n, as we used with the Fenman's trick and the Leibniz rule for integration, can be represented as the integral from zero to one of x to the m minus one minus one all over the natural log of x dx, right? So we have these two very useful integrals for hn and natural log of m which are the two characters in the euler mascheroni limit, and I've chosen particular integrals that have the same exact integral bounds, because you could do um, you know, the integral from one to x of one over uh, t dt to represent natural log of m, but that's not gonna be useful for us. So therefore, the euler mascheroni constant will be equal to the limit 
as n goes to infinity of these integrals subtracted to each other. So we're going to have the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus x to the power of n all over 1 minus x. And then we're going to have minus x to the m minus 1 minus 1 over the natural log of x dx. Now, we're going to be sending the limit as n goes to infinity here. And the only places where n is apparent is x to the n and x to the n plus 1. If x is between 0 and 1, which they are, then that sequence is going to converge to 0 as we already know. So that's going to vanish, and then that's going to take care of our limit. So therefore, we have that gamma is just equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over 1 minus x, and then we're going to have minus minus, which is just going to change to plus 1 all over the natural log of x dx. And this is a very useful representation for the digamma function. Now, there is another useful representation for digamma, and we can easily get it with substitution. So if we let x be equal to e to the u, given us dx is equal to e to the u du, and then changing our limits around, one can find that gamma is also equal to the integral from minus infinity to 0 of 1 over 1 minus e to the u plus 1 over u du times e to the u. So once you have this, then you can start playing around with your variables again. For example, we can let u be equal to minus x, giving us du is equal to minus 1 times dx. And once you change these variables around, then you can have the gamma, because I just want to get rid of that minus infinity on the bottom, because that's quite annoying, at least to me. That's going to give us the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus x, all over 1 minus e to the minus x, and then we're going to have minus e to the minus x over x. And you're like, ah, that's a lot of e to the minus x's, and you might be right. So multiply top and bottom by e to the positive x to clean this up a bit. So once you do that, you can find that gamma, another representation for gamma, is the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over e to the x minus 1, minus 1 over x e to the x. And this is the sometimes preferred representation for the euler mascheroni constant in terms of integrals. Now that we've done a quick little review of basic integral techniques, let's get into our previous problem of figuring out what exactly digamma of 1 was equal to. So what is digamma of 1 equal to? So digamma of 1, at least by definition, will be equal to 1 over gamma of x times the derivative of gamma of x evaluated when x is equal to 1. So that's going to be equal to 1 over gamma of x times the derivative of the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the x minus 1, e to the minus t dt. And again, we need to evaluate this when x is equal to 1. So this is going to be equal to what? So using the same exact trick as mentioned before, we're going to take that derivative, turn it into a partial with respect to x, and we're going to have the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the x minus 1 times the natural log of t e to minus t dt, and then we need to evaluate this when x is equal to 1. So now is the time to evaluate this when x is equal to 1. We're going to have gamma of 1, which is equal to 1, and then we're going to have t to the 1 minus 1, which is going to be equal to 0. So t to the 0 is going to be equal to 1. So we're going to have that digamma of 1 will just be equal to this integral from 0 to infinity of the natural log of t e to the minus t dt. So if you can evaluate this integral, then you're practically done. But this integral does look very friendly, but it's actually not friendly at all. Well, it depends on how you sort of view it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent this as the limit as n goes to infinity, and I'm going to write that as the integral from 0 to m. And then I'm going to look at this as the natural log of, and I'm actually going to switch my variables here. I'm going to write that as x, x, and x, because I just like working with x better. And we're going to have the natural log of x. And then I'm going to write e to the power of minus x in terms of that limit representation that we introduced before. So I'm going to have 1 minus x over to the power of n. And then I'm going to have m. But I'm going to decompose this n into m plus 1 and 1 minus x over m, because when we multiply 
um, they just combine. The only issue is when I'm taking the limit as n goes to infinity, this is just going to go to one, um, so I'm just gonna be left with the other term. And the reason that motivates this is because I want to use a substitution on that little term right there. So that gives us that di gamma of one will be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral from zero to m of the natural log of x of one minus x over n to the power of m minus one dx. Now it's time for the fun. So I'm going to let u be equal to one minus x over m. And once I do that, I'm going to have dx is equal to minus n du once rearranged. So once I have that, you should be able to also verify that this bound zero to n will change to one to zero. So once you make those substitutions, I'm gonna have the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral from one to zero. And then I'm gonna have the natural log of x, but x, once you rearrange this expression, is just gonna give us n times one minus u. And then I'm going to have, there's our u again, so u to the m minus one, and then dx is gonna be equal to this minus n du. All right, now once I have that, notice that I have the natural log of a product, so I'm just going to decompose that. Also note that this n is a constant, so I can factor that out, and this minus sign can reverse the order on my limits. So that's going to give us a di gamma of one will be equal to, and I'm gonna write this as the limit, as n goes to infinity of n, times the integral from zero to one. I'm gonna do the first term first, so I'm gonna have the natural log of n u to the m minus one, and then plus the natural log of one minus u times u to the m minus one du. So I have two integrals to deal with. So how am I going to deal with this? So notice that natural log of n is just a constant, so I can actually just factor that out. And then I'm just gonna be left with just a power rule integral on the inside. So once I do that, then I'm gonna have what? So psi of one will be equal to, the limit as n goes to infinity of n times the natural log of m times the integral from zero to one. Let's change our variables back again. So x to the m minus one dx. And then we have this little annoying integral over here. Let's see what we have here. Oh, let's not forget our little n there. There should be a little m. Then we're gonna have n to the integral zero to one of natural log of one minus u, u to the m minus one du. So we're integrating with respect to x. So we're just going to do what? So we're gonna add one to that exponent, divide by that new exponent, so we're gonna have one over n. That one over n is gonna cancel with that n there, and then we're gonna have one minus zero, which is one, and we're just gonna be left with that natural log of n there. So we're gonna have the di gamma of one will be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the natural log of m, and then plus n times the integral from zero to one, let's change our little bounds here, the natural log of one minus x, x to the power of n, that is m minus one, dx, right? Now this last integral is not that scary because keep in mind, we can actually write this in terms of a power series because that's just gonna be the sum from k is equal to one to infinity of one over k times x to the power of k. That's logarithmic series because notice that x is between 0, 1, and let's not forget our lonely little minus 1 in front of that. That's going to give us a x to the k, x to the m minus 1. We can add that. That's going to give us x to the power of k plus n minus 1. Integrate that. That gets rid of the minus 1, divides by n plus k, and that's going to give you an, a telescoping oscillating series. So once you actually work through that algebra, and I'll leave those details for you because it's actually a fun exercise that I recommend for anyone beginning with infinite series, you're just gonna be left with what is actually a very beautiful result. What you're actually gonna be left with is negative one over m times hn, the nth harmonic number. So that n, that minus one over n, obviously do cancel, and we're just gonna be left with di gamma of one, will be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the natural log of m 
minus hn, which is the reversal of the, of the euler mascheroni constant. So this is going to be equal to minus gamma. So if we return to the recursive identity in regards to harmonic numbers, digamma of n plus 1, that's just going to be equal to hn minus the euler mascheroni constant. And that gives us the closure of that particular identity. Now let's get into another very important property of the gamma function. The last concept that I want to introduce in terms of the gamma function, and generally other functions too, is what we mean by a function being convex and also logarithmically convex on a set. So we say that a function that maps a to r is convex if for all x, y, and a, and t in the closed interval 0, 1, so in some sense we're looking at a parametrization of some curve, then the image of ty plus 1 minus tx under f is always less than or equal to the linear combination of images of f of y and f of x, in particular of this form. And if you've learned about parametric equations, you should realize that that is just the parametrization of a line with respect to t because fx and fy are just numbers. So if we think about this from the graphical perspective, is this curve convex on this interval, let's say AB. Let's assume that A is closed interval AB. So if we pick any two points X, Y, so that means I'm allowed to choose those endpoints and connect them with a line, then these points will always be above the image of those domain combination points from A to B. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a smooth curve. It could be a square, it could be a polygon, it could be a bunch of things. The shape need not be differentiable or smooth. But as long as that line is entirely contained above that curve for any pair X, Y in the set capital A, then we say that that curve is convex. And if the logarithm composed with that function is convex, then we will just say that f is logarithmically convex. The reason we need logarithmic convexity is because some curves will grow super, super fast. And as we already know in terms of growth, because if you think, okay, well, y equals x squared is a convex function, but you know, x squared grows really, really fast as x gets big. And if we look sort of at y is equal to x, which is this curve right here, and then we also look at the logarithm of this curve, because what is the log of x squared, which is a convex function, x squared? That's just gonna be equal to two times the natural log of x, and that gives us this particular function, and it grows a little bit more slowly. So if the logarithm of that function is also convex, I'll obviously notice that the log function is not convex because if I were to compare, com connect these two lines, that line's entirely underneath my images. Um, then if we have that in the case that it is convex, then the original function is logarithmically convex. So it's possible that a non-convex function is logarithmically convex and also vice versa as well. Now, why do I want to bring this up? So this is connected to the next theorem, which I'll just call theorem four, and it states the following, that the gamma function is logarithmically convex. It's also a convex function, but more so it's logarithmically convex, which is a lot more useful in a lot of applications. So how are we going to prove that a function is logarithmically convex? So one corollary from the definition of convexity is the following, that if you have a differentiable curve that's convex, then what can you tell me about the second derivative? Well, you should be able to see that this function is concave up, right? So in particular, f prime of x must be greater than or equal to zero for all x in that domain. If this is the case, then this is true that the function is convex, and that's obviously an if and only if statement. So all we have to show is that the second derivative of that function is positive. Now, we're looking at logarithmic convexity, so we need to show that the logarithm composed with that is convex. So that means that the log of gamma of x is convex. So that's what we're looking at here. So what exactly is the second derivative of the log of gamma of x? So that's going to be equal to, so the derivative of the log of gamma of x, well, that's just going to be equal to 
gamma prime of x all over gamma of x, but we already know that that's just the digamma function. So we already know that gamma is differentiable. One can also show that digamma is also differentiable too. So if we look at the derivative of the digamma function, that's going to be equal to what? So that's going to be equal to the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared, right? So it's going to have that structure. Now the question becomes, is this truly a positive number, right? So is this truly positive? So we already know that gamma is strictly positive and showing that this numerator function is positive also is possible, but it's definitely beyond what I want to show at least for today. But a nice little calculation exercise is to actually show that this can be expressed as an integral. Moreover, you can express gamma prime x as the integral from zero to infinity of the natural log of t times t to the x minus one e to the minus t dt all over gamma of x squared, right? Or in some sense, that should be equal to the derivative of that. Right now, you can of course use the Leibniz rule to show that the derivative of that is equal to natural log of t squared. So technically, we can just ignore that and just be like, oh, that's just going to be the natural log of t squared. And then you can show that that integral is always non negative, and hence we have a non negative quantity. Right? So we have that the digamma function is always positive in terms of its derivative, which means the digamma function is increasing which means that the gamma function is logarithmically convex, okay? So that is a very interesting thing. And let's close with this very important theorem. And let's call this theorem five. And this theorem is named after two scientists, Bohr and Malyarov. So the Bohr-Malyarov theorem says the following. So we know several properties about the gamma function. Obviously the first is that f of one is equal to one for the gamma function. And the second is that f of x plus one is equal to x f of x for the gamma function. So one can ask, is the gamma function the only property that can extrapolate the factorial functions? Because that's practically all those two properties are. It's just the generalization of factorials. The answer is no. There's actually infinitely many functions that can extrapolate the factorial function. The gamma is not the only one. But if we add on the third property that f is logarithmically convex, and we look at these three properties together, then the bohr malyarov theorem says the following, that there exists a unique function, function f, that satisfies these three properties. Right? And this function f will map 0 to infinity to r, and it satisfies these three properties. And we've already shown that the gamma function satisfies all three of these properties, which means that the gamma function is the only logarithmically convex function that extrapolates the factorials, right? And that's practically what the ball Malera theorem says, right? So those are just some interesting and very useful properties that you definitely should know when working with the gamma and digamma functions. And also the Euler Mascheroni constant. Hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.